We have to say that the general strike of 1926 was one of the greatest events in the history of the British labour movement. Now, I say it was great in two ways. Firstly, due to the scale and the strength of the strike, I think close to four million workers actually uh, took action out of a total of about five and a half million uh, active trade unionists. And actually, this figure was, uh, was actually lower than it could have been, as many workers were actually deliberately kept back from the struggle by the trade union leadership. And it, of course, brought the country to a complete standstill. Uh, with the like of which had never actually seen, uh, been seen before or even since. It showed the tremendous power of the working class when it actually moves together as a class. Uh, but it, <coughs> it was also great in the sense that it was the greatest betrayal of the working class by its own leadership, which you know, rather than actually harnessing that power uh, to conduct the socialist transformation of society, they did everything they could to keep power in the hands of the capitalist class and bring the strike to an early end. So I've got a lot to say about the strike, uh, but I don't have much time. So I want to focus really firstly on the background to the strike. You know, what were the conditions that actually led to this kind of pre-revolutionary situation uh, developing? Because uh, obviously a strike like this doesn't just fall from the sky. And like, we, we need to learn kind of what conditions to look out for uh, in the future. But we also want to, uh, want to give a glimpse of the enormous power of the working class once it's on the move, as uh, the events were truly inspirational. I also want to highlight the actions of the ruling class what measures they were prepared to, to actually defeat the strike. Because uh, there's a lot of uh, lessons there in uh, the role of the capitalist state. And also contrast the determination of the ruling class to the role played by the, uh, the workers' leaders, who, as I said, undermined the potential of the working class and led this uh, strike to defeat. Now, in outlining the background to uh, the general strike, I'm going to have to go into the history of various uh, minor strikes that um, kind of occurred in the years before that. Now, it's for good reason that the miners were considered the vanguard of uh, the British working class, uh, not, not only due to their crucial role in production and you know, providing energy to the whole of industry, uh, but to the high degree of class consciousness. And that itself is a, a product of the conditions of work uh, and the conditions of struggle. Also, the deterioration of the British mining industry was symptomatic of British industry as a whole. And the ruling class uh, understood very well that in order to attack the working class generally, they would have to first defeat the miners. But they, that was also understood by a very wide layer of the working class, who understood that the miners' strike was ultimately, or their struggle was ultimately their struggle as well. And that's ultimately how uh, a, a struggle between uh, the miners on the one hand and the, and the mine owners quickly became a struggle between a whole class against another. Now, there are some periods in history where the ruling class can uh, afford to actually make concessions and throw some crumbs off the table. There's others, though, when in order to maintain any profitability, the, rule, the capitalists are forced to go on the offensive. And that was really the situation that developed in the, the mid-1920s. Now, for decades, you've seen the decline of British industry. This was uh, clearly brought to a head with uh, the First World War, which saw Britain emerge considerably weaker with respect to uh, American capitalism in particular. But there was also the political impact of the war uh, on the working class, and that was massive. The war, remember, had led to the, uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917, the German Revolution of 1918, very turbulent events uh, developing all over Europe. And these events had a massive impact on workers in Britain, such that there was a pre-revolutionary situation actually uh, developing in early 1919. In January of that year, the government actually sent 10,000 troops uh, into Glasgow uh, to try and uh, suppress a strike that was actually developing back then into general strike proportions. And during those events in 1919, the Miners' Federation, which was the, the union of the mine workers, this was a union that was 800,000 strong out of a total of 1.2 million miners. They were pressing for a 30% wage increase, a six-hour working day, and nationalisation of the mines under workers' control. Now, of course, these demands were rejected by the government, uh, who had actually taken control over the mines during the First World War, although they were still privately owned. <coughs> Straight away, in response, the miners threatened a, a strike. And this was at the same time that other unions, which were in a, an, a, an alliance with the miners' uh, union, this was called the Triple Alliance, it was forged between the mining, railway, and transport unions. They were also pushing their own demands in this period of uh, intense class struggle. And the government was therefore terrified of a general strike uh, developing, which they weren't actually prepared for. Uh, therefore, the government maneuvered, and they, uh, they called a royal commission uh, which was supposed to investigate the mining industry, uh, the findings of uh, which would supposedly be binding on the, uh, on the government. And this is quite an old tactic which had been uh, used previously to quite some success in order to try and uh, kind of cut across the class struggle uh, 
and diffuse um, such anger. And this is important to note because it will be used again later in 1925 in the run-up to the strike. And this actually had the desired effect. You know, within 17 days of calling this commission, the government uh, came out and recommended higher wages. They, uh, they recommended a seven-hour working day. And the leaders of the Miners' Federation actually accepted this, and they called the strike off. Now, this, uh, we can see, was clearly a, a, a result of the ruling class uh, grant, granting concessions in order to try and save the system as a whole, and in order to stop the movement getting out of hand. Now, of course, as Marxists, we fight for any progressive reforms of the working class, but at the same time, we point out the limited uh, nature or temporary nature of these reforms under capitalism. And this was certainly the case with these uh, concessions granted to the miners, which, as I said, were necessary in order for the ruling class to buy class peace. But at a certain point, when the capitalists uh, feel strong enough, uh, all these reforms will come under attack, as they ultimately couldn't be afforded in the long run. And that's precisely what happened soon after. So in February 1921, the government handed back control over the mines to the original mine owners. And immediately the mine owners went back on the offensive, and they announced drastic cuts uh, to the miners' wages uh, <coughs> in order to, uh, to make them uh, so-called economically viable. Uh, this time, however, uh, despite the strike being actually called by this triple alliance, it quickly broke down. And this was due to a split at the tops of the, uh, the unions about whether to accept a settlement. And uh, it ultimately it very quickly collapsed and, and the alliance broke down, leaving the miners to fight this uh, struggle alone. Now that breakdown became known as uh, Black Friday. It was a very important event in the British labour movement. And really it was a very humiliating climb down uh, for the whole trade union movement. The miners were eventually defeated a few months later. And uh, this led to a general offensive of the bosses against the working class. Uh, and it you know, began with the miners, but actually six million workers subsequently had their wages uh, cut. Now the miners' wages were actually softened, or cuts to their wages were softened, by the granting of a 10 million pound uh, government subsidy to the coal owners. But all, the, all of these events had a big impact on consciousness. You know, many saw how the miners' struggle was connected to the general class struggle. And um, many people drew the lesson that if, if united, you could extract big concessions uh, from the capitalists, but if the movement was divided, it would suffer big defeats. At the same time as uh, all of this, there was a, a big shift within the, uh, the trade union uh, movements to the left. In 1921, you had the, the, the Parliamentary Committee of uh, the TUC uh, transformed itself into a greatly strengthened general council uh, with powers to actually represent the movement as a whole. Uh, but despite these defeats, such as Black Friday, the general mood within the, the rank and file in the working class uh, remained very militant. You had as well the election of uh, A.J. Cook, who was a militant miners' leader from uh, the Rhondda Valley in uh, South Wales, to the leadership of the Miners' Federation in 1924. And this uh, man, Cook, he described himself as a Marxist. Although he'd actually broken with the Communist Party, uh, which he was a member of previously, uh, he's probably what we more uh, term like a centrist. Uh, he's talking very left or even revolutionary in words, but actually when it comes down to the crunch, um, kind of acting in a reformist way. But nevertheless, he was a, a far more militant and a, f a far better leader than, uh, than kind of all the others at that time. And this was uh, a reflection of a, a general leftward shift uh, throughout the whole labour uh, movement. You also at that time had the election of uh, so-called left leaders, or seemingly left leaders, to the uh, TUC General Council. So figures such as uh, Purcell, who is uh, leader of the Furniture Workers Union, uh, Hicks, who is uh, leader of the Building uh, Trades Union, uh, and a man called Swales, who is uh, of the Engineers Union. Uh, as well as this, you also had the development of the Communist Party, which uh, anyone who was in the previous session with Ben Glinetsky would have heard a lot about. They played a significant role in strengthening this uh, movement. They were excluded officially from um, affiliation to the Labour Party. Uh, they were, their affiliation was blocked by the Labour Party leadership, but that didn't stop many Communist Party members actually joining the party as individuals. And they began systematic work in the trade unions from 1923 as a result of the, uh, the United Front uh, tactic in the Communist International. And uh, the Industrial Committee of the Communist Party actually began to draw together the various rank and file movements in the trade unions, beginning initially with the miners, into a unified minority movement. And uh, the actual, they uh, developed this national minority movement, launched, was launched officially in August 1924. And the aim of that was to, to transform the trade unions into militant fighting organisations, 
uh, which were to be a weapon for actually transforming society as a whole, and not just for fighting for, for wage increases or shorter hours. And they emphasised, uh, as part of this, the development of factory committees and also trades councils, uh, the idea of which was to become kind of central organising bodies uh, for the class struggle in every area. Now, with the fall of the Labour government in uh, November 1924, this really opened the door to a full-on capitalist offensive. At the, at the time, the ruling class really thought, this is the, the moment now to claw back all the concessions that they've granted in the past and return British capitalism to profitability. Connected with that, in 1925, the then Chancellor Winston Churchill announced a return uh, of the pound to the gold standard. And the, the reasoning behind this was they were very keen to return London uh, to its kind of position as the kind of uh, um, world financial centre. But in order to um, restore the value of uh, the pound to a fixed rate with gold, it meant that exports would become extremely uncompetitive on the, the world market unless the costs of production, were, uh, in, which included wages, of course, were enormously slashed. So that's the sort of general background to uh, the, the period leading up to the general strike. The ruling class knew that in order to go on this offensive and successfully attack the working class as a whole, they needed to break, uh, break the back of uh, the miners' union first. And this... Uh, as an aside, was uh, a lesson that was uh, keenly understood by uh, Thatcher and the Tories in the 80s and why they went after the miners then. But all things came to a head on the 30th of June in 1925 when the coal owners gave a month's notice to terminate the existing uh, contracts of the miners uh, with drastic wage cuts of 13.5%, an increase of the working day and the scrapping of national agreements. Now, the next day, the Tory Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, he announced at a meeting with the miners' union that all the workers in this country have got to take reductions in wages in order to put industry back on its feet. This, of course, was rejected by the miners' union at a special conference uh, the day after, and they referred the matter to the general council of the TUC, which proceeded to uh, appoint a committee of nine uh, to negotiate with the coal owners and the government. And during this time, there was an active campaign of militant miners, supported as well by this national minority movement, uh, which you know, had uh, kind of key, um, uh, key backing from the Communist Party. And uh, this pressure from below led to key sections of, uh, of, of the trade union movement offering their support to the miners. And I think a lot of the leaders um, in the trade unions were afraid that if they didn't actually come out and publicly back the miners' uh, struggle, that they themselves would lose uh, leadership of this movement to the communists who were putting forward these uh, kind of militant demands. And as a result of that pressure, a month later, on the 30th of July, there was a special uh, conference of trade union executives which actually agreed to ratify an embargo on the movement of coal in the event that uh, this lockout uh, by the mine owners actually uh, proceeded. And this was agreed to by the Committee of Nine as well as the General Council. The result was that the very same day the Tory cabinet, the government, uh, were recalled for an emergency session and the government, um, after I think, quite a short deliberation, decided to back off and, uh, and offered a temporary retreat. And uh, they, they offered a nine-month uh, continuation of this subsidy to the uh, uh, mining industry in return for the mine owners calling off the lockout uh, and again for the calling of a royal commission to investigate the, the reorganisation of the industry. And this event became known as Red Friday in the movement in contrast to uh, Black Friday that went uh, a few years before. Now, I think the government realised at the time that they weren't in a position to actually take on the ruling, uh, sorry, the working class, and they needed more time in order to prepare for a more decisive showdown. But the leaders of the Labour Party simply just uh, celebrated Red Friday as a victory. Uh, they just called it simply a triumph of right and justice, as if it was this kind of moral uh, victory. They didn't see that, in fact, the victory was obtained through you know, struggle, you know, class unity, uh, mobilisation and organisation, and that, in fact, it was only a temporary victory that the real task ahead was to prepare for the greater showdown that was coming. Now, the government, on, on the other hand, did in fact prepare, and they prepared well. Almost immediately, they set to, to work on the organisation uh, of the Organisation for the Maintenance of Supplies, the OMS. In other words, the Organisation for the Scabbing of a Strike. And they roped in various generals and, uh, and lords and establishment figures to create what was in effect a paramilitary strike-breaking force. It was supposed to be private and voluntary, but it had the full backing of the ruling class in terms of finances, resources and facilities. 
And as part of this uh, force, it included the recruitment of thousands of so-called special constables, a middle-class types who fancied themselves as uh, policemen, and they were equipped with uh, truncheons and helmets and so on. Uh, and they also incorporated most of the uh, the kind of the elements of British fascism at that time, which was still a kind of uh, um, kind of young force then. They were really the shock troops of uh, the far right, and uh, they were incorporated into this under the leadership of a retired brigadier general. The government made uh, very detailed uh, preparations for kind of what to do in the event of a general strike and how to break it. They divided England and Wales into ten uh, divisions, each with its own civil commissioner. There was a separate scheme in uh, Scotland, but it was very similar. The civil commissioners were generally uh, junior government ministers, and they were instructed to maintain law and order. Uh, they were meant to control road transport, food, and fuel supplies. Now, one of these commissioners, who was a, uh, a man called Lord Winterton, he said that we were given the further instructions that in the event of a complete breakdown, to take drastic action of a comprehensive character. Now remember, this was in the context of uh, you know, the revolutionary situations in Russia, Germany, and elsewhere. So you can see that the ruling class had this uh, firmly in their minds. For good measure as well, the government also had arrested uh, 12 leaders of the Communist Party and sentenced them to between 6 to 12 months in prison. Their idea was, of course, to try and paralyze the party, to uh, deprive it of leadership, and divide the labor movement. But in reality, it had the opposite effect. There was a mass campaign of solidarity throughout the whole labor movement, and a big increase in Communist Party membership as a result. But what was actually done by the General Council in order to, pre to prepare for a strike? Well, almost nothing, in fact. They, uh, the outlook of the General Council was to assume that they would uh, simply just use this in order to negotiate a new settlement uh, with the, the government. And they put all of their hopes into this uh, royal commission uh, that was being prepared and actually told workers to hold back from struggle and, uh, and to not worry about uh, preparing, just wait for the royal commission to publish its findings. In September, um, you also had the, um, the strengthening of the right wing within the TUC. Uh, the Congress of the TUC elected a man called Jimmy Thomas, who was an extreme right wing leader of the, uh, the National Union of Railwaymen. Uh, he was elected back onto the General Council, uh, along with uh, another reformist leader, Ernst Bevan. And this meant that the General Council was even more kind of shifted to the right. Later on in March, the Royal Commission finally published its uh, findings. It was known as the Samuel Report, after Sir Herbert Samuel, who was the man leading this. The aim was to divide the Labour movement by really giving the right-wing leaders an excuse to sell out the movement and say, look, well, we've got this Royal Commission, we've just got to use that as a basis for negotiations. The report rejected the nationalisation of the mines uh, and instead proposed that they should be reorganised in the future <coughs> under private ownership. But really the key point of the report was that wages had to be decreased now and that the, the government subsidy to the mine owners had to come to an end immediately, uh, as well as in the uh, increase in the hours of the working day. Now this would, uh, would have been clearly a disaster for the miners. Nevertheless, uh, the Labour leadership kind of reacted very uh, enthusiastically to this report uh, Ramsay MacDonald, who was the leader of the Labour Party, hailed it positively as a, a landmark report. The Industrial Committee, which was set up by the General Council and uh, dominated by the right wing, urged that this report be used for the basis of negotiations to bring this uh, dispute with the mine owners to an end. But the Miners' Federation, to their credit, remained firm. They stuck to their demands, which were not, not a penny off the pay and not a second on the day. And they were in absolutely no mood to compromise with uh, the mine owners, they were prepared to take strike action by themselves, uh, if necessary, in order to win these demands. And uh, remember, at this time, mine, uh, mine, sorry, miners' wages were already at semi-starvation levels. You know, they weren't prepared to accept any further cuts. But still, the TUC General Council did nothing really to actually to prepare for a strike. And this was, as uh, fundamentally, they didn't want one. They thought still that they could negotiate with the government and that this threatened general strike was simply just a kind of uh, tool to add pressure onto the ruling class. And they thought it would again be like uh, uh, the situation in 1919, where even just the, the, the calling of a strike would be enough to kind of uh, win all their demands. But really, they hadn't appreciated that the, the fundamental objective situation had changed. Of course, the negotiations became deadlocked. Ernst Bevan, uh, who was on the General Council, he actually admitted after these, uh, all the events that the General Council only called a meeting to prepare what to do for, the, for in the, the event of a breakdown in negotiations, three days before the lockout notices uh, from the mine owners were due to come into effect. 
and that they actually had no plans at all to, to run a general strike. Now, everything came to a head on the 1st of May at a conference of uh, trade union executives where uh, the general council gave its report to the executives on what the situation was, i.e. the fact that, this, uh, that the negotiations were completely deadlocked. And uh, <clears throat> the conference took a vote, which was to place the powers in the hands of the general council and to conduct a general stoppage, i.e. a general strike. And this vote was, uh, was won overwhelmingly. It was done on a delegate basis, but the delegates uh, in favour of this represented 3.65 million workers compared to th those opposing it, 49,911. The General Council therefore found itself kind of stumbling into a general strike that it actually itself didn't actually want to lead. It's, even then, it still thought that it could negotiate uh, a settlement with the government over the next few days, and that the strike vote itself, again, would still just be enough to put enough pressure on the government to back down. And you can see this, uh, Jimmy Thomas, this right-wing leader um, on the General Council, he said, I suppose my usual critics will say that I was almost groveling, and it's true. In all my long experience, I never begged and pleaded as I have done today. He said, not just because I believed in the cause of the miners, but because I believed in my bones that it was my duty to the country uh, that I involved it. Now, clearly, his idea of duty to the country didn't, of course, mean duty to the working class of the country, uh, but it meant to the, to the capitalists of the country. Uh, Ramsay MacDonald, again, who said is the leader of the Labour Party, he said at that time, just as it was about to, uh, to, uh, to break, he said, I don't like general strikes, but honestly, what can be done? And that really summed up the position of the, uh, of, uh, the Labour leadership at that time. Uh, the, the, the position that the reformists found themselves in, kind of against their wishes, but this, this general strike had kind of uh, gone over their heads, and then now they were kind of uh, having to lead it uh, reluctantly. Now, negotiations were still ongoing uh, with the government when events were really brought to a head by an unofficial strike of print workers at the Daily Mail. And they'd refused to print uh, a provocative anti-union editorial titled For King and Country. Now, the Tory Prime Minister Baldwin, he feigned complete outrage of this, uh, and he demanded immediately that the TUC denounce this kind of wildcat strike of uh, the print workers, as well as calling off the general strike immediately. Now, of course, the TUC leaders uh, very quickly uh, repudiated the, the Daily Mail strike and said that they, uh, they wanted to, to, that was a mistake and that they, should, uh, they were going to put pressure on them to end it. But when they rushed back to Downing Street to inform the government uh, of this, they were simply told uh, that uh, the Prime Minister had gone to bed and couldn't be disturbed. You know, they were completely snubbed. And uh, really, by then, it was clear the government wanted the strike, and it was just using this as a pretext. Uh, and it was too late to really call it off uh, from the workers' leaders. The, the wheels for it were already in motion. And uh, Jimmy Thomas, he, he, he's reported to have come away from Downing Street at that time, literally in tears, and uh, clearly, he feared the general strike way more than the, uh, the Tories did, who had actually been preparing uh, for this kind of showdown for months. And Jimmy Thomas said, in any challenge to the Constitution, God help Britain unless the government won. Now, with leaders like that, who needs enemies? <laughs> so, <clears throat> despite the, the complete lack of preparation by the leadership, the response from below was, uh, was incredible. It was actually overwhelming. At midnight on uh, the 3rd of May, which is when the, the strike uh, officially began, there was only three unions out of 1,100 which had refused to answer the strike call. The industrial heartlands of Britain were brought to a complete standstill. The railways and public services were, uh, were brought to a complete halt. Just some figures. In London, uh, not one of the 4,000 buses which were run by the London uh, General Omnibus Company were actually running uh, that next day. Only nine trams out of 2,000 actually uh, moved anywhere, and only 15 out of 315 tube trains were on the move. And these were only for very short distances. The docks across the country were completely silent. Only the National Sailors and Firemen's Union actually openly scabbed the strike, but a number of the branches at the kind of rank and file level uh, went ahead with the strike anyway against the, uh, um, the instructions of their leadership. The, uh, the volunteer scab force of the OMS proved completely ineffectual. You know, these middle-class professionals and students uh, were largely incapable of actually uh, driving the buses and trains. Uh, many ended up crashing to, uh, to much comedy. <laughs> and uh, most ended up trying to kind of work on the docks. Uh, but they only succeeded in, uh, in getting anything moving towards the, the end of the strike. 
uh, and this was under incredibly heavy um, uh, military protection. You'd never actually seen working class uh, action on this scale before. It had really only been dreamt of by, um, by workers for many decades. You know, this was the first time that the working class began to actually feel their real power and act as solidly as one unified class. Now, of course, the general council was not expecting this at all. Uh, there's many reports that they said, uh, we have from all over the country uh, reports that have suppressed, uh, surpassed all our expectations. They said the difficulty of the general council has been to keep men in, in what we might call the second line of defense rather than uh, 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 call them out. Now, this idea of a second line of defense is worth mentioning. This was actually uh, you know, a mistake, and it, it shows the kind of uh, half-hearted kind of uh, reformist attitude to the strike. Rather than going all out and calling the working class out to, uh, to paralyze the country, the general uh, council adopted this tactic of just calling some layers out initially and keeping others in reverse uh, with the idea of kind of bringing more and more into the dispute uh, as a kind of bargaining uh, 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 position against the government. So initially, the, the workers who were out on strike were, of course, well, the 1.2 million miners were, were locked out. They weren't technically on strike. But then in support of them, you had workers from all forms of uh, transport. You had the dockers. You had uh, printing trades, the iron and steel workers, metal and heavy chemical workers, as well as building workers, or with the exception of those who were working on uh, house building or hospital extensions. But it didn't include some key sections like uh, shipping, uh, shipbuilders, uh, power uh, workers, the post office, which at that time included the, uh, the telephone exchanges, engineers, electricians, as, uh, as well as some others. And uh, of course, a wide, wide layer of uh, workers responded to the call. There were actually many villagers who had, who had never seen a strike in their life suddenly coming to the forefront of this uh, struggle. And uh, so inspired were people by the strength of this uh, movement that large numbers of unorganized workers who weren't in a union actually joined the strike. You know, nobody wanted to be that person who was, uh, who was scabbing this movement. By the second day, the, uh, you saw this uh, development of uh, councils of action. Uh, they sprung into effect all over the country. And this, uh, they combined elected delegates from uh, trades councils, the, kind of, uh, the trade unions, and local labor parties. And the idea was that they acted as really as district headquarters of the strike. And they coordinated the activities on the, of the strike on the ground in each area. And uh, these were really, in, in most cases, organizations that were, uh, were moribund or even non-existing in many places. They were completely transformed by the heat of the struggle. The councils organized picketing, communications, uh, the, the granting of permits for transport and other things, and uh, even workers' defense corps in some areas. The strength, uh, uh, to be fair, varied across uh, the country, but in the industrial heartlands, uh, some of them were very strong. And in, in effect, they were the kind of embryo organs of a new form of workers' power. With each day of the strike, these councils of action became uh, 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 stronger and stronger, you know, better organized, and kind of, uh, kind of uh, more general in their scope. And uh, this is a report from a sheet metal worker in Ashton. He said, employers of labor were coming cap in hand, begging for permission to do certain things, or to be more correct, to allow their workers to perform certain customary operations. He said, most of them turned away empty after a most humiliating experience, for one and all were put through a stern questioning, just to make them realize that we, and not they, were the salt of the earth. Now, in some areas, uh, like uh, Northumberland and Durham in the northeast, where the strike was the strongest, the councils of action were so strong that government representatives were forced to go to these councils of action and actually plead for permits, and actually were refused. And it showed the workers were take, beginning to take power into their own hands. And this is something you see develop in nearly all kind of indefinite uh, general strikes or kind of revolutionary situations or mass movements, which is the beginnings of a situation of dual power. And that's something that both the ruling class as well as these reformist leaders at the time understood to one degree or another. The ruling class and the government knew that they had to take whatever measures necessary in order to defeat the strike. And they were confident that they could do this and that the strike really was the first step in a general onslaught against the working class as a whole. But the reformists were terrified of this developing dual power. They feared control of the strike actually passing from their hands and they were terrified of revolutionaries actually becoming uh, the leading factor in the strike and taking the movement all the way. And instead of therefore strengthening the strike, these reformist leaders kept it limited 
while at the same time falling over themselves to do a deal uh, with the government in order to bring the strike to an end. Now you can see the contrasting measures uh, <coughs> in the, the approaches taken by uh, the government and their state on the one hand and the, the trade union uh, uh, leaders on the other. The state had created the OMS. You know, they prepared this for nine months in advance uh, in order to, to uh, battle the, the strikers. This was immediately incorporated fully into the, uh, the apparatus of the state. And uh, the, the OMS scabs were told that they had uh, the full authority to do whatever it takes to defeat the strike. In contrast, uh, on the worker side, you had this uh, councils of action, which were not prepared for really in advance, except from uh, initiatives from the Communist Party. Their success really came down to the magnificent capacity for the working class actually uh, to organize and struggle. Now, as I said, some of these were very powerful, but all of them were, were limited in their scope. And they were hampered by very vague or limited instructions from the general council of the TUC, which gave very little authority to the councils to actually make decisions themselves or really take con uh, control of their areas. And it meant many days were actually wasted by hundreds of councils having to send their messengers uh, down to TUC headquarters in London for interpretation or clarity over the orders that they were receiving. And it, it took them days to set up regional and district uh, structures, and that hamstrung a lot of efforts for effective uh, mass picketing. There were many complaints from workers that uh, transport permits uh, were, were just being handed out far too freely to the, to the bosses, and it was undermining the, the power of the strike. The government uh, very quickly uh, set up its own propaganda paper, which was called the British Gazette, and this was edited directly by Winston Churchill. It was aided by support from all the millionaire press, particularly the Morning Post, the Daily Mail, uh, and the Daily Express, who all offered the use of their printing presses and skilled scabs in order to get these papers out. And the, the print works where they actually printed this were surrounded by an army of uh, police in order to protect it from uh, pickets. And from the start, the main editorial line was that this, this strike was a threat to the Constitution, to the British Empire, to law and order, to democracy, to the family, and to religion. And uh, just on that point, for good measure, the head of the Catholic Church as she came out and declared the strike to be a sin against God, uh, of course. You know, it had the BBC being used as uh, the propaganda agency of the ruling class, which it is. Uh, there was non-stop attacks on strikers, you know, appeals for scabs, fake reports of mass defections and so on. In contrast, you had the British Worker, which is uh, this paper here, which was, was very kindly been uh, brought in today by uh, Comrade Terry McPartman. And uh, this was set up by the TUC. And its key message was actually uh, proposing uh, restraint. It's, uh, it emphasized repeatedly that the strike was simply an industrial uh, dispute and no threat to the constitution. And uh, you can see it said, message to all workers. The general counsel of the TUC Congress wishes to em emphasize that this is an industrial dispute. It expects every member taking part to be exemplary in his conduct and not give any opportunity for police interference. The outbreak of any disturbances would be very damaging to the prospects of a successful termination of this dispute. And there's pages and pages of this kind of line. Huge uh, editorial saying this is not a threat to the constitution and so on. Um, it, would, it, it plays such a role that the editor of the Times, you know, very establishment paper, congratulated this, uh, the editors of this for being a moderating influence uh, on the course of the strike. The state took immediate measures as well to prevent the Communist Party from uh, printing their own paper, the Workers' Daily. Even before the strike started, the police uh, raided their headquarters and smashed up the printing presses. And instead, they managed with very great difficulty to produce a strike sheet called the Workers' Bulletin. The police, uh, um, throughout the strike, actually resorted to arresting anybody they found selling it. Uh, and, and at one point, even anybody just in possession of a, a copy of this paper could face between six weeks to, to two months in prison. And that leads me on to the role of the police and the military. The police arrested thousands of strikers during the course of uh, the strike. Miners and communists were particular targets, and they used tens of thousands of these special constables who were often sent to areas far away from their homes uh, and given license, really, to go on the rampage against uh, the working class. There was heavy use of baton charges, as well as raids on Communist Party offices, homes, the seizure of duplicators and, uh, and printing materials and so on. The, uh, the ruling class brought in the military I think really initially more to intimidate the working class than anything else, uh, as I think really the, the ruling class would have thought twice before actually using the military to attack the workers, so I think they would have been terrified of actually the military splitting along class lines. But nevertheless, all military leave was cancelled. Two battalions were dispatched to Liverpool, as well as another two to surround the London docks, 
and they were supported with cavalry and, um, and armed cars. Battleships were anchored in the Mersey, the Clyde of Swansea, uh, Cardiff, and, and other cities. Hyde Park was turned into a kind of armed camp. But in contrast, the TUC made no real effort, uh, in fact, no effort at all, to organize uh, workers' defense corps. In fact, they actually uh, positively argued against it. The general council instead uh, was doing its utmost to keep workers at home rather than joining the pickets. And one appeal from the general council, which uh, I've actually found in this paper here, but I'll, I'll read it off my notes just for, uh, um, for clarity. The appeal said, uh, advise workers to keep smiling, refuse to be provoked, get into your garden, look after the wife and kiddies. I said, if you've not got a garden, go out into the country, parks and playgrounds. Do not hang around the centre of the city. And here, this is advice that could have come straight from Winston Churchill and the, uh, and the British Gazette. They instead tried to organize football matches to keep strikers away from any kind of militant action. But of course, this advice wasn't listened to by many workers. Uh, in many areas, the councils of action did indeed organize workers' defense corps, often on Communist Party initiative. In Methil, in the Fife Coalfield, after police charges on mass pickets and these baton charges, the council of action reorganized the defense corps. They increased it from 150 to 700 volunteers, half of whom had actually served in the First World War. And they proceeded to then march through the town in military formation, armed with pick shafts. After that, the police didn't dare touch the, uh, the strikers again. And that's really a key lesson for the left, that it is possible to defeat the power of the capitalist state if we're suitably organized and determined. Now, of course, the government was alarmed by these developments, but they knew that the real way to defeat the strike was to actually go after its leaders. And they used the full machinery of the state to soften them up. On the third day of the strike, the attorney general gave a speech to the House of Commons declaring the whole strike illegal. And he said that every trade union leader who advised and promoted this course of action is liable in damages to the uttermost farthing of his personal possessions. They also used the press and the military, as I said, to suggest that the government was preparing for civil war. And indeed it was. And after a few days, the government even threatened the arrest of the entire uh, TUC leadership. So when we say that bourgeois democracy is uh, simply a screen for the dictatorship of uh, capital, you can really see this very clearly throughout the course of the strike. And as I mentioned, both the government and the TEC leadership understood that a general strike in this sense really poses the question of power, like who runs society. You know, either the working class will move forward and, uh, and uh, take power, or it will suffer a crushing defeat. And the government therefore took whatever actions necessary it thought to, uh, to hang on to power, whilst the TEC leadership did everything they could to make sure that the strike didn't challenge this power. And this, uh, this really is summed up uh, by another quote from Jimmy Thomas, who I said was one of the key leaders uh, on the TEC General Council. He said, what I dreaded about this strike more than anything else was this. If by chance it should have got out of the hands of those who would be able to exercise some control, every sane man knows what would have happened. I thank God that it never did, but that fear was always in our minds. Therefore, on the third day of the strike, you had uh, Sir Herbert Samuel, who was the man who had previously led this royal commission, he was called back from his uh, nice holiday in Italy uh, to immediately begin secret negotiations with uh, Jimmy Thomas. And again, they used his previous Samuel report as a basis for negotiations. Now, after days of negotiations, the General Council agreed to endorse this new Samuel memorandum, which was simply a rehash of his report from 1925. And this contained no concessions from the coal owners whatsoever. It still involved huge cuts to, uh, to wages and longer hours. But, the, but Samuel had, uh, had kind of personally given apparently a vague and undocumented hint that this uh, subsidy to the mine uh, owners may be continued. Uh, but <clears throat> this, um, this Samuel memorandum was agreed behind the backs of the miners' leaders who, who knew nothing about it, and they were effectively sold out by the, uh, the general council. Now on the eighth day, despite this Sam uh, Samuel memorandum having no authority whatsoever from the government, the TUC leaders proposed to call off the strike. And uh, of course, the miners' leaders were furious about this. They said, this proposal contains nothing for what we've been fighting for all along. It has no guarantees that this lockout would be actually ended, or any guarantees at all against uh, victimization. But Thomas said, uh, well, you may not trust my word, uh, but will you not trust the word of a British gentleman, i.e. Samuel, who's been the governor of Palestine? Now, of course, the, the, uh, the miners uh, were, were absolutely right not to trust this uh, British gentleman, as uh, proved subsequently by the events. The next day, on the 12th of May, the General Council unconditionally surrendered to the Prime Minister without any terms, without any written <laughs> statement, or demands for any guarantees, 
and in contradiction to the miners' leaders, who were, who were adamant that they wanted to continue the struggle. Uh, immediately an announcement was made on the BBC that the, uh, the strike had been uh, called off and that it was an unconditional surrender. But as predicted by the miners, the lockout <laughs> notices were not withdrawn. There was no suggestion of any continued subsidy for wages and any further negotiations. And this uh, news came as a complete shock to millions of workers uh, because actually at that point the strike was actually at its most strongest, uh, precisely at the point where it was being called off. And actually 24 hours after the official surrender, the number of strikers actually increased by 100,000. And this included railway men, dockers, engineers, and other sections uh, who renewed the strike in order to prevent it from ending up as a complete rout. And they were attempting to uh, uh, resist uh, enormous victimization, which the bosses began in earnest. And faced with that growing out anger, uh, Baldwin, the Prime Minister, announced that employers must take back workers without any uh, victimization. But in reality, hundreds of thousands were indeed victimized, were made unemployed, and were taken back on worse terms and conditions. The miners actually held out until the end of November, but eventually they were starved back to work. They were forced to accept all of the conditions of the owners without any concessions whatsoever. But going back to the actual sellout, the initial shock of this surrender was uh, followed by an intense sense of betrayal. There's a report from the Wakefield Strike Committee. They said that the position on the 12th of May was that there was no sign of weakening. On the contrary, the spirit was magnificent, and the consternation and dismay prevailed when the news that the strike had uh, been called off had been confirmed. And this sense of betrayal was particularly felt against the so-called lefts on the General Council, uh, who many workers had illusions in. You know, it wasn't simply that they'd, uh, these lefts had remained silent, or had just simply been outnumbered uh, by those on the right. Uh, they actually played an active role themselves in this betrayal. So Purser was directly involved in negotiations with the government to bring it to an end. Hicks was actually foremost in uh, rejecting a massive donation of uh, 1.25 million pounds raised by uh, Russian workers. Uh, and he actually referred to this donation as damned Soviet gold. And many couldn't understand the actions of these men. You know, people understood the betrayal of people like Thomas and the right wing, but many people thought that the lefts were on their side. And it leads us to this question of, well, why did these left-wing uh, um, people betray? Now, Trotsky actually remarked that, actually, betrayal is inherent in, uh, in the politics of reformism. And this isn't a question of, uh, of, of like a kind of conscious betrayal. I'm sure that many of these people are very sincere in what they're doing, but it's not really a question of their sincerity, but it's a political question. As fundamentally, all reformists, including the left reformists, do not think that workers can take power and run society themselves. They've got no perspective at all of a fundamental transformation of society, i.e. of socialism. They think that society can only be changed gradually, bit by bit, through the framework of the existing society. And that, you know, essentially this means just appealing to the capitalists to be nicer and uh, to be more humane to, to workers. But many of these people are terrified of actually embarking on a revolutionary struggle against the capitalist state, which they see as all-powerful. They've got no confidence of winning such a struggle, no confidence in the working class to create an even stronger power than the capitalist state. Uh, they've got no confidence in splitting the army and the police and winning them on class lines. And therefore, when it comes to the crunch, they become more scared of an actual revolution developing, uh, that, that this kind of movement of the workers getting out of their own hands, than they do of uh, selling out the movement to the capitalists. And you've seen this time and time again throughout history, and always with uh, tragic consequences. Now, I've got to sum up just a very brief word on the role of the Communist Party. There's loads more that could be said about it. But even from before the strike, its membership had risen dramatically. It had been warning for months of the coming struggle and for workers to get prepared. And during the course of the strike, it nearly doubled its membership from 6,000 to, to over 10,000. Uh, but in many areas, it, it actually formed the backbone of these councils of action. But ultimately, it failed to fully rise to the challenge of the strike to expose and replace the reformist leadership. And it actually helped foster illusions in these so-called left trade union leaders, uh, illusions which they've been building up for over a year. And in large part, that was due to the formation of the Anglo-Russian uh, Trade Union Committee, which was in theory a united front between Russian and British trade unions. But the Stalinist leadership of the Communist International uh, urged uncritical support of these left trade union leaders, who they themselves uh, had illusions in as offering a point of support for the Soviet Union. And from the agreement of this pact in 1925, the activities of the Communist Party markedly changed. They watered down their criticisms of uh, the leaders and, uh, and ended up just promoting these, uh, these left ones. And therefore, before and throughout the strike, it actually subordinated its own independent activity to just playing the role of loyal trade unionists rather than of revolutionaries. 
and it limited itself to just calling on the leaders of the TUC to carry out a left policy, rather than strengthening the rank and file to carry out this challenge to the leadership itself. And once the betrayal took place, it did, there was an, although there was a change in their, um, uh, in their material they put forward for a change of leadership, they'd actually done nothing concretely to actually build for and prepare for this, uh, this challenge to take place. Had they pursued an energetic and independent policy, they could have emerged from the general strike enormously strengthened, even in the event of this uh, defeat. But as it turned out, they couldn't es escape uh, part of the blame for the defeat, particularly uh, this sense of betrayal against the lefts, which the Communist Party had helped to uh, kind of promote. So although the Communist Party continued to grow until uh, October, the defeat of the miners in November had a very profound effect, and many, many drifted away uh, from the party, in it, and it never really kind of, or didn't recover for many, many years. Now, after the strike, uh, I'll sum up, the very reformist leaders who, who led its betrayal uh, simply declared never again. They said uh, they tried to theorise the defeat as inevitable for all general strikes. They said that they're impossible to win and, and dangerous to try and therefore shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be done again. They tried to put the blame for its defeat anywhere but themselves. But the real lesson of the general strike really is the need to prepare for an advance to understand the conditions that give rise to these kind of mass political strikes so that we're not taken by surprise by them. There are, of course, different kinds of general strike, you know, ones of a limited duration, like a one-day or two-day general strike, which really are more of a form of protest. But that, you know, an indefinite general strike like these events really pose the question of power. And for that, you need a revolutionary organisation that can lead such a strike to victory, and that cannot be improvised on the spot. You need to prepare for that in advance. So that's what we're trying to do here, and that's why I'd encourage you to join us in that task.